For many generations, black people have suffered injustice and equality, inequality for no other reason than the color of their skin. It's time to change that once and for all. Our beautiful beaches community is very progressive in many ways. That is why we are all here today. There has been an outpour of love and support from the community and for that I thank you all. We can all be allies by using our privilege and power to dismantle institutionalized racism. Small changes are significant. Call people out. When light is shed on racism and institutional issues, you create awareness and ignite change. Let us unite and stand together and lead with love. We are stronger together. Okay, I'm, I'm in tears right now. I'm sorry, but this is really beautiful. Thank you, Sapphira, for starting this. Thank you to each and every one of you. I was born in South Africa. I come from a mixed background. My parents came to Canada because of apartheid. We have an opportunity because COVID has shone a light on how cruel systemic racism is for black, indigenous, and racialized people. And the areas of the city where most black and racialized people live are the areas that have been hardest hit by COVID. We know that it's all the systems, it's education, it's health, and it's particularly policing. Every single one of you is vital for that fight. Because black people, indigenous people, racialized people can't do it by themselves. Thank you to each and every one of you for coming out here today. And thank you so much for pulling this together. One, two, three, four, racism no more. Five, six, seven, eight, use your love, not your hate. No justice, no peace. Black lives matter. Racial discrimination is generally not a problem for white people. When you don't experience it or see it, you don't understand it. So I have invited several black voices of our community to share their experiences and stories with you. Well, thank you everyone for coming out today. It has been very inspiring for me to, to march with members of my community here in the beaches. And it's a quote actually from Malcolm X and he says, that's not a chip on my shoulder, that's your foot on my neck. While that quote is in fact very timely and it is a good job at the system right now what what struck me is how things have not changed almost at all between ne then and now what we saw in the horrifying uh, death of George Floyd was uh, an officer's knee on a black man's neck we still suffer the same types of fear and discrimination from police that we were fighting to abolish during civil rights systemic racism and discrimination in Canada has been historically ingrained into our public life, into our public institutions, and it's about time that we call attention to that and we don't take it anymore. Just outside of Main Station, I personally have been stopped by police six times. Six times. Shame! shame. Yes, shame, because each time it was, oh, you looked like someone. We're just making sure you're okay. Okay, from what? It's four o'clock in the afternoon, I have a backpack, I'm coming home from school, I look like everyone else. What's there to fear? Certainly not the color of my skin, right? While it is not always going to be that obvious when we are facing racism, in Canada, it manifests itself everywhere. Like our MPP, Rima Burns, said so eloquently, it manifests itself in our education system, where black students are often directed towards lower education pathways. Prime example again, me and my two siblings um, were all told throughout elementary school, throughout middle school, 
that we could not make it in university. We essentially didn't have the mental chops. And here we are, two of us in a PhD, one of us about to finish the Our healthcare system. Racism and discrimination is manifested there, but we barely know how because our government refuses to collect racial data. Black Canadians are on average are uh, six times higher unemployment rate than other marginalized or people of color. Black Canadians also make, on average, $12,000 less a year than other people of color. When people ask, well, what can be done about that? Our elected officials can stop bending one knee, they can bend both, sit at their desks, and start pending legislation that fixes this problem. Yeah. As Rosa Parks said, we will only fail when we fail to try. Thank you. I was in LA during the Rodney King incident with the riots. I was just on the phone with my, my friend, my white friend who still lives there. And we're reminiscing about how LA was on fire then and it's on fire again now. My personal mission is to create a world that has love, peace, and prosperity. And I do that by sharing my truth, my vulnerability, and my gifts. That's my personal mission. But I haven't been living up to that mission. No matter what I do, because of the, the color of my skin, the color of my family's skin, even though I try to protect them, we're not protected. My son has been called the N-word just a few blocks away from here. The saddest part about that to me as a father is knowing that he already knows that someone's gonna judge him who's never met him before just because of the color of his skin. So that's what I'm asking you today is use your voice, use your vote, and use your money to end this now. 1883, Emma Lazarus said that until we are all free, we are none of us free. In 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King said, no one is free until we're all free. And here we are, 2020. None of us are free until we're all free. I live in a privileged position in a first world country where I have running water and I can stand here on this platform and speak my voice, tell my truth. Not everyone gets to do that. And according to the Ontario Human Rights Commission, black people in Toronto are 20 times more likely to be shot by the police than white people. You might be tempted to try to make this an all lives matters conversation. And if you have, you might have a black friend who gotten mad at you. And they may have even called you a racist. They're mad at you because it disrespects black people and it, it dilutes this conversation to make it something more palatable or something more relatable. So I really appreciate the fact that this hasn't been turned into an all lives matters conversation. All lives do matter, but this is a black conversation. And when you're having your conversation, I'll be there to stand with you. Thank you very much. I want to urge you to continue these conversations within your own homes. That's where change begins. The way that you can start the conversation with your children is to begin to just diversify their environment by having books that show and showcase all different kinds of people. They talk about how blackness was a creation that was made to encourage and not to feel morally responsible for enslaving lives and how it was before that, before 1917, this was not something that existed. This Up to just two years ago, a friend of mine had asked me if I'd ever experienced racism and out outright I answered that question by saying no, I hadn't. And because what I was speaking about was overt racism and that was untrue, I have experienced covert racism in the form of not seeing people who look like me on television shows, on the magazine covers, people at the highest rates in organizations, and that is not normal. I was normalizing that, and it's not normal. There are educated, brilliant, capable people of this community who have just been oppressed, and it's time for the oppression to stop. So build that trust within yourself first, and get there so that we can make a difference for our children. They deserve better than this. Thank you so much. This movement has empowered empowered us to speak our stories. I grew up here in the beach. I went to St. John's, and I was the only person of color in my class. There were days when, when I would come home 
and I would tell my mom, who happens to be biracial, but I would tell her, I wish I could be the color of the palms of my hair. I grew up in a, in a home where my mom came from South Africa and my father from Guyana. Although my mom did come here because of apartheid, um, I still didn't feel that I was less than anybody else until I came to school. And I was, I was treated or shunned sometimes or called the N-word or made me feel like I wanted to be the palms of, the color of the palms of my hands. Growing up, I had the privilege of my, my parents and my grandparents talking about the great leaders like Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu who fought for freedom and justice in South Africa. I still, in our school, we were reading books like To Kill a Mockingbird or always something to do with slavery or domestic workers, never showing showing the example of people of color in a beautiful way. So of course my white friends would look at me as less than. I would then feel less than, and I, grew, I, I, let, I spent my whole life feeling that. Children don't see the color of their skin. They love each other unconditionally. And I encourage all of you to keep that love that children have as they grow older, have those conversations, encourage them to be the ones that speak up for their friends, ask the questions, challenge the teachers. There's nothing wrong with having a conversation. Ubuntu means I am because we are. And I can't be me without you. And you can't be you without me. Ubuntu means oneness. And if we can all be one, then maybe we can get through this. Growing up in Buffalo, New York, not a great place to grow up. Been racially profiled, experienced police brutality. I was George Floyd, but I'm here to speak to you today. Imaginary color lines in the city of Buffalo. We tried to live in the city of Buffalo. And then when our eldest son became school late, we said, no, 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 we're moving to Toronto, a better place to raise a family. And at the end of the day, there shouldn't be any race lines here. We, we're, we're, we're all human beings here. Now let's take this. Let's not leave it here. Let's take it back to our homes. Let's go to our circles of influence. And let's make change, starting today. I'm here today, and I'm inspired to do this because my father taught me growing up to always speak your voice. And he taught me courage and bravery. And he showed that up until he died nine months ago. Clayton Alcender Charles, and he emigrated from the Caribbean to Toronto in 1968. He graduated from York University in sociology and from University of Toronto with a degree in education. My father tried numerous times to get an entry level job with the Ontario government in the early 1980s. And after many tries, he finally got a job. In his goal to break through the racial barriers for himself and others, he talked to supervisors and managers to help others like himself who wanted better job opportunities. After years of fighting and never giving up on his dream for himself and other blacks and opportunity oppressed people who worked in the same entry level jobs for years on end, he took action by spearheading the Affirmative Action Group in Canada. After months of fighting for affirmative action for blacks and the oppressed who were blatantly overlooked, eventually more black people began to win job competitions for better jobs with more pay. The fight is not over even 40 years later. Let's not give up until change happens.